Much has been made of strategy and strategic planning. Just a quick review on Amazon, YouTube, Google, or a trip to your local bookshop shows the enormous range of literature there is on this subject. I suppose that's both good and bad. On the one hand, there's been some significant body of research on this. There are examples of companies and organisations that do this well. There are also examples and lessons that we can learn from companies who have not done this as well. This presentation is really designed for small and mid-sized companies that want to get after a practical and simple approach to strategy and strategic planning. This slideshow is going to walk through a number of key areas. We're going to start with the basic question, what is strategy? I've never been in a company that has started off the strategic planning cycle with that simple question. It's never been on the agenda. The assumption is that everyone knows. It doesn't take long to go through this, but could align individuals from the start. Why do we conduct these sessions and who is this actually for? Again, clarifications that are worth noting down at the very start of the process. There are myriad tools and approaches that can be used. I'm going to provide some very simple ones that I think will help you get to the execution phase. Finally, after getting the thinking done, we need to be able to translate this into action and start to execute on the plans developed. So, we're going to build the strategic blueprint that will take us to execution, or maybe this is a better graphic. To provide context, let me give you a brief summary of my background. I've worked at a number of very well-known consumer brands. This has all been in the sports and fashion industry, apart from a brief stint at a subsidiary of the office automation company, Rico. I started my career at Nike at the start of the 90s. This encompassed a number of disciplines, including production, manufacturing, inventory control, sales, logistics, and operations. I was also fortunate to do this in a number of countries. After Nike, I moved to the footwear company Clarks. From there, I went to the luxury online fashion pure player Netaporte. Finally, I worked at the footwear company Doc Martens. Nearly all my roles, apart from at Nike, have been in the operations sphere. The companies have also been distinct in their ownership structures, from publicly traded to family owned and from group subsidiary to private equity owned. Underpinning this, I also completed the Global Executive MBA at IESA Business School in Barcelona, Spain. As I said, there are numerous articles, literature and presentations available on the subject of strategy and strategic planning. There are a number of globally renowned practitioners and academics in the field. If we look at definitions of what strategy is, we can get quite a few different perspectives. I've picked out a few leading thinkers on the subject, as well as taking a definition from Wikipedia. You can see a number of differences between them. This is not a presentation that will cover the academic areas of strategy development. Seen from certain perspectives, any number of definitions can seem appropriate. We're going to be looking at a simple strategic planning approach. It's designed more for small to mid-sized businesses, but can be leveraged in larger companies as well. Although these particular viewpoints may look different, there are also quite a number of common themes that become apparent in strategic planning. One element to consider is that of timescale. Strategic planning is tasked with looking into the future and considering the company in a number of years. The time frame will be dependent on industry, but would generally consider things within a three or five year time horizon. Next, we can consider differentiation. What sets the company apart from its competitors? This is a particular theme of Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, whose definition was on the preceding slide. We're really considering what the company can bring that is unique and will set itself apart from the competition. Key to strategy is going to be the ability and need to prioritize the ideas and actions that come out of the planning work which leads us nicely onto the allocation of resources and how we cut the pie in order to support the initiatives that we've determined. Finally, most strategies consider some sort of return. I've listed financial performance, but the essence is really an understanding of what we're going to get from the plan. This could be something like increases in revenues, the projected share price over time, future cash flows discounted with some sort of net present value, or a mixture of a number of return measures. So if we consider those as elements of strategy, who exactly are we doing this for? Well, the short answer is almost everybody. Let's use the standard pyramid approach. In terms of the level of detail, the top of the pyramid is going to consider the highest level items of the plan. This is likely to be at the group, corporate, or potentially business unit level. This is the top of the pyramid and reflects probably the most confidential nature of the plan. Traditionally, this is then disseminated in some form or another, or potentially not at all, to the remainder of the organization. There is certainly something to be said for strategic openness. 
If the strategy is carefully crafted and PowerPoint slides locked in an executive filing cabinet, it's going to be difficult to get traction around the plan. So there are quite a few elements that are going to need to be transparent, but there are some elements whose publication is going to need to be more restricted. I've worked for companies that try to lock everything away on a need to know basis, and it is clear that it sub-optimizes the plan if we cannot communicate to staff where the company is going and a rough idea on how we're going to get there. It's a question of balance. The plan shouldn't be locked away and accessed by just a few people. It should also not be a free-for-all that gives the competition an opportunity to minimise the impact. At the detailed level at the bottom of the pyramid, we're looking at the individual or team. So those included at the top level will be the senior leadership of the company and the board. They're going to help shape and determine the final content. Shared and communicated at the board level, there could also be some interested outside parties, such as banks and investors, as well as key partners, that are going to help shape and have input to the plan, as well as communicated to with the outcomes. Communication is going to go down the pyramid to include staff and potentially details out through press releases and public statements. As stated before, what is shared can be determined through the right balance of engagement and corporate responsibility, but there should be a communication plan developed to support this. This is also a good graphic to show that all elements are going to provide input to the strategic plan as well. Again, I've seen this done well in some companies and others that feel it's the sole preserve of senior leadership. The key point here is to try and get the right level of input wherever that is in the organisation. At Clark's, we worked with a company called Positive Reframe that provided interesting statistics on the information and involvement that shop floor retail staff can have on helping provide key consumer insights. Well, we've established the elements of strategy and also the levels that it incorporates. Why is it that we do this? I think the number one reason here is focus. This has to be far and away the most important reason. We've seen on the common elements of strategy that we're dealing with prioritization, timing, investing and diversification facets. And all of this is going to provide the business with focus and provide the company with direction and expectations. Tied to the previous slide, this is also why it's important to get input from the right areas in the right way and also be able to share the strategy in the right way so that everyone is pulling in the same direction. There is a significant balance that needs to be struck when completing strategic planning. Getting the balance right is critical in ensuring that we can follow through on the plan and also make the right elements relevant to the right people. This is going to take a bit of discussion within the management team. Here are a couple of case studies. Case study one highlights a company that had a very loose strategic planning approach. There were some high level objectives, but certainly no structured or integrated planning methodology. This led to sub-optimization of the initiatives that were determined, constantly changing priorities as new initiatives arose, and little focus, meaning it was difficult for the organization to align behind the direction. The second case study highlights a company that had a significant amount of strategic planning, as well as a much more complex approach. It was very bureaucratic, with a heavy emphasis internal to the organisation. This meant that initiatives took far longer to get through the planning process, which absorbed management resource. The internal focus and length of time also reduced the impact that initiatives had in the marketplace. We're looking to deploy a simple method of strategic planning that allows the company to grow, but as we'll see, we also need to ensure that we have the right inputs for effective planning. This guide is designed to provide that balance. OK, let's start building the future. There are a number of key inputs to the strategic planning process. Let's start at the top of the company. Ideally, there will be some form of vision and mission that help guide our planning inputs. This has been evident in every company that I've worked for. This is essentially giving us the top line parameters to work within. Values is also an interesting element to use as input. As an aside, I've seen this done in a number of ways. When I joined Nike, the values that were in place were performance, authenticity, commitment, innovation and teamwork. They seemed to sum the company up and were particularly clear. Most importantly, they were managed towards at all levels and at the heart of the employee development process. They also had a certain ring to the company's business and aligned with the culture, or you could look at that vice versa. I also worked at a company where we developed the values as an executive team. This was an interesting exercise. We went through the standard descriptions, which are similar to the words in the mood graphic, integrity, honesty, etc. We then put forward a list that was not so generic and lent itself more to the company specifically. What made this company different from others and therefore what values were different? In that regard, we had two sets. 
the first stage of what is required and then the differentiator that made us different. This was an interesting approach. What is important is that the values are instilled and that this does not just turn into a tick box episode to show that they have been developed, which I have also seen. So that covers the top line parameters. Now we can add a bit more context. Here are a number of other areas that need to be considered as input to the strategic planning process. I'll start with the consumer. This is about revisiting the target consumer or consumers for the company. This will give us a clear understanding of their needs and wants and ideally what drives them. In a lot of cases this could already be available so it's just a case of confirming it. Nike and Netaporte did this particularly well. After that we can add a summary of the competition and where our company sits in the marketplace. This can include standard measures such as market share, revenues, profitability etc but should also cover areas such as products and services provided. Comparing that to the target consumer is important and also determining potential areas of differentiation. Then we should examine where we currently are. This sets a baseline for current performance and initiatives. Where have we ended up based on our previous plan? In some companies that I've come into the strategic plan was not clear but in some organisations there could already be a potential plan that is or is not being followed so assessing that would be a good idea. In all cases, there is usually a financial plan that is already determined and that needs to be reaffirmed. The financial obligations could come from shareholder expectations or bank financing, etc. As with a lot of the elements in the plan, this is an ongoing process. There are likely to be revisions through the process, so this is setting out the current thinking, but may need to be adjusted along the way. Then there is the fundamental tool that most people use. I'll not go into a lot of detail on this as there are many resources that can be accessed to give you some a grounding in SWOT, but essentially we're looking to assess the internal strengths and weaknesses and external opportunities and threats. A simple but very effective tool. There is another tool that I've used that is similar but much more action oriented. Have a look online for the TOWS analysis, T-O-W-S. It is designed to pull together actions on linking the four parts and is quite a potent tool. The last four areas, consumer profile, competitive analysis, previous plans and SWOT, are key. It is also an area where feedback from all levels in the organisation should be collated. Try not to make an industry out of this. It's not about the bureaucracy, but about trying to get a summary on what people think. Getting that feedback from the people closest to the consumer could offer very important insights. A number of companies that I've worked for wanted to push a central message down, but if the consumer is not responsive or the message would be more effective by changing the strategy slightly, that could be very important to the final success of the plan. Taking all this together has now given us a platform on which to build the plans for the future. This is us completing the homework before the planning. So, with the homework completed, how are we going to build the plan? This is completed in a meeting with the key company decision makers. There's quite a bit of iteration that will be required. We've got the inputs, but we're going to have to sift those and start culling some of the initiatives that are not going to support enough of the overall business and financial targets. Trying to do too much is as bad as not having enough clarity around what is required. To provide a little more structure, create a list of the initiatives in priority order. We're then going to feed that into a matrix to provide a little more detail. Provide a simple summary in the initiatives column. The capabilities required go in the following column, followed by the proposed action or solution. Finally, we'll consider the impacts. Let's detail this more with some simple examples. We bring in the four columns again and start to populate with data. Just to be absolutely clear, the examples are random and not from any particular business. The objective here is just to establish the matrix as a tool and provide simple generic examples as a guideline. The initiatives need to be relatively smart. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-based. Here you can see that the first one refers to revenue growth being driven by an acquisition strategy. In order to be able to do that, capabilities need to be in place that identify the kind of companies to acquire. There are also deal-making and legal skills, as well as an investment pot to be in place to support the business initiative. That then takes us to the actions that need to be deployed to make those capabilities possible. This is going to be subjective and open to iteration. In this example, the decision is to outsource the market and legal expertise required, but there will be training required to support bringing the new firms into the company. Finally, we're earmarking an investment fund to support the plan. At the end, we're going to consider some of the risks associated with the actions. In this case, maybe outsourcing the process removes ownership, or that there are no companies available for the money set aside. 
These are the potential risks that we can identify. It's about trying to assess beforehand what the obstacles and failure points could be. It's possible to go into excessive detail on this, so it'll come down to balance again. Another example could be to improve cash flow for a pharmaceutical company through a generic strategy. In this case, the capability will be a whole new business unit to be set up, and the actions will be the hiring of that team and the associated product pipeline. We might need to be concerned about the product profitability and the impact that a generics business could have on final net earnings target. I would envision some form of rough overall business case that includes things like expected costs and revenue expectations and that can be further detailed in the following stage. Before we get there, let's have another couple of examples. The matrix can be used for more operational departments as well. A takedown from the bigger strategies can help departments develop their own strategic plan which can be shared with staff. Here, an example that considers same-day replenishment for accounts. For this to be completed, we clearly need stock to be located close enough to meet the agreed replenishment standards and getting information between the parties. The solution could be outsourcing a logistics provision and creating EDI links between the departments or companies involved. As we execute that, we might need to be aware of the additional stock in the network and what that might mean for things like cash flow and inventory obsolescence. From a sales perspective, we might want to grow the percentage of business that comes from strategic accounts. That may mean a different approach to planning and the skills required for the sales team. It could also mean increasing the success of products for this account base. For that to be accomplished, we might need to deploy a new system and selling skills training for staff. Specialised product development supports the need for mutual profitability as well as differentiated product in the marketplace and a revised set of criteria to assess customers' eligibility to be considered a strategic account. The concerns might be around staff rotation and their ability to learn quickly enough, as well as a product development pipeline to support the profit targets. Again, let's not get caught up in the detail of the examples, but appreciate the overall planning approach between the initiatives, capabilities, actions and impacts. Between the previous two slides, we've been able to look at a number of examples, one slide looking at the very high corporate level and this slide concentrating on the department level. The key is that the objectives flow down and dependencies between them articulated. OK, with the initiatives listed, we now need to time phase the plans and also be able to tie them to individuals and teams within the organisation. The starting point is the list of initiatives and capabilities. Adding certain information such as dependencies etc will help, but we now need to be more time bound. The next stage is to add the actions in a file and decide on the timing of the items. This is a file that can be used very quickly to get a visual representation on when tasks have been completed and can also provide a clear view of particularly taxing times when actions are grouped in the same time period. The level of detail is up for debate. As this is a file that can be used for individual objective setting, detail can be added. If the company has an overall program management office or project coordinator, this can be used to ensure that all drivers are managed from the overall level. Feel free to add a few extra columns if you want to assign responsibility for the item or even add a RACI, R-A-C-I structure to it. Historically, I've broken down some of the individual base plans into three segments, people, process and technology. However, they could also be broken down by the strategic driver and subtopics or objectives added and time phased. I've added in a bit more detail to the action plan template. The name of the initiative starts the section followed by a very brief description or header for that particular action. In this example of an acquisition strategy, the action could read something like completing a tender for a market analysis company. Just an example. This is then followed by some sort of time horizon. In this template, years one and two are by quarter, years three and four by halves, and the final year, year five, is in one bucket. Again, just an example. We follow this a bit more narrative around the action itself where slightly more detail can be added. The following column looks at dependencies. As I've numbered each action, I can reference those in this column or just add what dependencies are required for this line item. I then finish this template with a rough idea on the expected revenues to be generated by the action and or the relevant cost expectation. As with the previous examples of the initiatives, these are just illustrations. The fundamental message is to filter down the strategic initiatives into action plans that are individual, business unit or team specific. So where have we arrived to? We started with the column elements of strategic planning. 
These were some kind of longer term time horizon, usually measured in years, how we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace, a form of prioritization and the allocation of resources before finally some form of return listed here as financial. We talked about the traditional approach of top-down strategy formulation from the executive branch to the employees in a staged approach, but that all levels should be able to offer insights and input to the strategic planning cycle. Strategic planning is there to provide the organisation with focus and a clear path to the future. Starting the strategic planning process, we looked at some preparatory work, which starts with the fundamental building blocks of the vision, mission and values, before looking at more detail around the consumer profile, competitive analysis, any current plans and financial objectives, as well as more traditional strategic planning tools like the SWOT analysis. We then fill out a matrix of business initiatives. These consider the capabilities required to deliver the initiatives, followed by the actions and any impacts of those actions. Finally, we can add more detail through a time phase plan that can extend all the way from the corporate head office to the individual. Bringing this to a close, we can revisit some of the aspects of the planning approach. We've seen the importance of a top-down and bottom-up approach to this planning methodology. It makes sense to get input at all levels in the organisation. Try not to make this too onerous, but solicit feedback as part of the SWOT analysis. The nature of this approach is also to develop a consistent structure to strategic planning. Should we identify an issue in one solution, we can quickly establish what drove us to that conclusion rather than having to start the process again from the beginning. We just need to work back from the issue and establish the adjustments that need to be made. The final plans focus on adding the element of time. The simple Gantt chart template allows us to see where excessive effort is required and mitigate if that is considered to be too onerous. It's also worth making sure that we're focusing on the critical few things rather than trying to change too much with too little resources. The templates and approach are scalable for organisations of different sizes and structures. Some companies may have a programme management team and others not, but the approach allows for companies of varying sizes as well as the ambitions they want to achieve. Again, trying to do too much will lead to a lack of focus. Finally, this approach will also support the top corporate planning process all the way to the individual. Tying the two together is important as it will facilitate the execution and successful completion of the plan. Thank you and good luck.